All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So everyone, thanks for joining us. It's another one of our office hours that is exclusive for those of you who are using our MCAT mobile application. We're uh, really excited that you're here uh, with us and hopefully you'll find tonight's session to be helpful. Uh, the topic for today is we are going to be going through uh, some topics uh, for the ChemPhys section, specifically looking at physics uh, with waves. So uh, with me here today is Matthias. Matthias, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, hi. Uh, I, uh, I'm part of Med School Coach. I work on content development and am also a uh, tutor for Med School Coach. Mm -hmm. Yep, and of course you'll notice that Matthias has a 99th percentile MCAT score, so he's achieved an extremely impressive MCAT score. And for myself, uh, my name is Ken, I'm the director of MCAT for Med School Coach, so I oversee all aspects of our MCAT program. And before I came to Med School Coach to start our MCAT program, I was an MCAT instructor, premier tutor, content developer, and instructor trainer at the Princeton Review for about five years. So I've been doing this uh, MCAT preparation for quite a while now. Okay, so here's the outline for today. We're gonna start first by talking about light by going through geometric optics. So going through mirrors and lenses and talking about wave and particle properties, essentially looking at the wave particle duality of light. From there, we're gonna talk about diffraction. Diffraction is a property of light that a lot of students don't understand very well. So we're gonna walk through uh, what diffraction is and sort of what you see with single slits as well as double slits and eventually gratings and crystallography. And we have a pretty good number of diagrams, so hopefully you'll be able to have a much better understanding of these topics after today's session. And of course, in the very end, we're going to have open Q&A, so if you have any questions about anything we go over today or any questions about anything related to MCAT, you're more than welcome to ask them at the end. All right, so to begin with, light. Is light a wave or a particle? What do you think, Matthias? Uh, I, I think that's above my pay grade to actually answer convincingly. Um, that, that's, you know, um, as far as the MCAT goes, I, I, none of us have to actually care what it really is. The MCAT wants you to be able to figure out what should I be using, which model should I be using, and put the tr physical truth, the deeper truths of reality kind of to the back of your mind. Um, because the different models, the particle model will be much easier to deal with if you want to model the photoelectric effect or something else. Um, and the wave model is the only one that gives an exp explanation of diffraction without really doing a lot of math homework. Very nice. So essentially, if we, if we want to keep it simple for the MCAT, we would simply say that uh, light has both wave properties and particle par properties. It really depends on the situation that you're looking at. So uh, one case where we definitely think of light acting as a particle is with the photoelectric effect. So Matthias, can you tell us a little bit about the photoelectric effect? Yeah. Um, well, the photoelectric effect is pretty much what it sounds like. A photon, it's a metal, and an excited electron comes out. Um, some no name by the name of Einstein figured that one out. Um, it, but the interesting thing about this is not just that you eject an electron, but that the energy of the kinetic energy of the ejected electron is very closely related to um, to exactly the energy of the photon. So let me start using the annotation feature here, and. Uh, and give you an idea. So if we had our little proton here, or really the entire nucleus of a metal atom, and on some energy level, we've got some valence electron. You guys can probably recall that I could have a photon of the right wavelength come in and excite it. But that doesn't guarantee that it's actually going to fly off into space and going to be ejected. It could just be a higher energy level and then it comes back down. Can anybody in, in chat here tell me what would happen if that was the case? What would I observe as it comes back down in energy level? Energy is emitted. What do you think of that? 
You're not entirely wrong. Uh, technically, heat is not a wrong answer either, since no thermodynamic process is perfect. But the most notable thing you'll see happening is a new photon is emitted. Right. And the wavelength of that photon will be exactly the difference in energy between these two energy levels for whatever the transition it is, is that it's making. Um, but the photoelectric effect now says, well, OK, but what if, and we should maybe wipe real quick, what if instead, instead of just taking it to higher energy level, I take it all the way so far that it's not caught by the atom again. So now, if the energy of that photon is greater than what is keeping it there, that's called phi or the work function. Well, it's not really keeping it there. Um, but either way, uh, if the energy of the photon is enough to actually bump it right out, there you go. Um, the interesting thing to note about this is that the kinetic energy that the electron will have will be however much energy the electron, sorry, the photon coming in had, so our energy of the photon, just HF, minus the energy that it took to liberate it, the work function. Mm -hmm. Very good. So yeah. essentially, to, to describe it in, in uh, simpler terms, the photoelectric effect refers to this phenomena where when you shine photons of light on metals, it's possible for you to eject electrons from the metal. These electrons being ejected from photons are what we call photoelectrons. And the equation that Matthias was walking through essentially tells you what kinetic energy that the ejected photoelectrons would have. And that's essentially the energy of the photon minus the amount of energy required to eject that photon, sorry, that electron in the first place called the work function. Very good. So this gives us some idea of light acting as a particle. So now how about light acting as a wave? We have a number of different properties here and we're not gonna talk about all of them right now. We have quite a number of slides that's gonna go through many of these terms. But the important thing is that uh, when you look at these different phenomena of light uh, with the Doppler effect, refraction, diffraction, and scattering, it's clear that light also exhibits properties of waves. So this is what is often called in quantum mechanics, the wave particle duality of light. Okay, very good. So the next thing that we're going to look at is uh, geometric optics. So geometric optics is looking at uh, mirrors and lenses. And in this case, Matthias, what are we thinking of light as? Uh, to anybody that just put a lot of stock into wave particle duality, I have, a, I have slightly disappointing news. Now we're going to think of it as rays. Um, conveniently enough, rays are the one thing that doesn't need a big introduction. Rays are just straight lines coming from some source going on to infinity. Mm -hmm. Very good. And what we're going to be looking at are lenses. And in a bit, we're going to be looking at mirrors. Now, in this case, what we can know is that lenses are a material of higher refractive index. I guess one thing that would be good to define is what exactly is refractive index? Um, I'm happy to jump in. Um, the refractive index is uh, essentially a measure of how much, or yeah, how much slower than in a vacuum light is in the, that particular medium. Um, so logically for a vacuum, the refractive index would be one, and for anything else, it would be greater than one. That's it. Mm -hmm. Everything that's not a vacuum has a refractive index greater than one. Um, that's why we said here, usually of a higher refractive index. Mm -hmm. You could have a lens submerged in something, say water, and that lens could have a refractive index less than that of water, and it will still work as a lens, but let's not overcomplicate our lives. 
Yeah, and typically when you're looking at geometric optics on the MCAT, it, you usually assume that the light is starting in air and it's going into the lens. So typically you're going to be going from lower to higher index of fraction. Although, of course, when light enters the lens, that's the case. But when light leaves the lens, then you have the opposite. So light going from a higher to a lower index of refraction. Very good. And of course, when we're looking at lenses as well as mirrors, we put a lot of focus on what the object is because the object is placed at some distance from the mirror of the lens and an image is generated from the object. Now, often when we talk about the image, we discuss these terms called real and virtual, right? And a lot of students have kind of memorized, oh, if the image distance is negative, that means I have a virtual image. And if I have an image distance that's positive, I have a real image. But often students don't really understand sort of where do these terms come from. So Matthias, can you break that down for us? Yeah, happy to do that. And we'll, we'll get some more mileage out of that and look at that a little bit more in the next slide as well. Um, real images are those that are formed for, for gray tracing by rays that actually intersect. We did our ray trace where light or our rays went through a lens and it turns out they intersect on the other side. It gives us a real image. It doesn't matter how, what exactly the lens was. Yes, there are lenses that will tend to form real images, others virtual, um, but if it's made by converging rays, it's a real image. Likewise, if we had to sort of instead look at diverging rays and backtrace where they would have converged if they were actually converging rays, then we call that a virtual image. Um, one thing I want to point out quickly before we move on that gives students trouble sometimes when experimental designs mention a laser or anything. An object is simply the source of our rays that we care about and want to model. It doesn't have to be the entire object, just whatever bit you care about, where you're going to start tracing, where you're going to start thinking about it, that's your object. And your image is simply the location where those rays converge, period. No exceptions to that. Very good. And when we're looking at lenses and mirrors, uh, not all mirrors and lenses are the same. So something we're uh, often interested in is sort of how powerful is that lens or mirror? And that's related to this idea of the focal length. And it looks like you have a question that you want to throw to our students here. So you want to explain, uh, or maybe you want to throw this question to the students first. Yeah. Um... Well, I'll, I'll start very vague and we'll narrow it down in a second. If I just have, let's say I have a convex lens and I send a bunch of parallel rays going through it, what happens? What happens to those rays? So I am make a little drawing of our situation here. And a nice little parallel rays coming right in. They do bend, Taylor, that is true. But what direction? Yeah, star, um, star is kind of onto it. Yeah, inwards, they converge, exactly. They'll converge. This, however, because we just threw basically an infinite amount of parallel rays at our lens, that's not an image, that's the focus. Wherever rays converge, for a, wherever a set of parallel rays converge, well, sorry, parallel rays along the principal axis of a lens, so basically perpendicular to the lens, wherever those converge, that's your focus. And we're going to have better diagrams on the next page, and we'll look at what exactly we can kind of deduce from knowing just that. Mm -hmm. And I also, if, of course, once you've identified the focus, the focal length refers to the distance uh, between the geometric optic and the focus. Very yeah. good. So then next, uh, let's look at a few topics here, looking at reflection as well as refraction. So I guess refraction, 
uh, we've been talking about how when you look at a lens, you're starting from one medium, such as air. So the light is starting in the air, and then it's entering the lens, which is of a different medium. Light actually does some very interesting things when you pass or when you start in one medium and you encounter a second medium. There's actually two possible things that can happen to the light rays. One is refraction and one is reflection. So Matthias, you want to explain what refraction is? Yeah, so refraction is going to be the one where they change direction, basically. And reflection, we can draw that in up there, is, well, where they're effectively not even really Where's my line not coming? Um, effectively not even really changing direction because they main, maintain the exact same angle to the normal as beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So another way of thinking about it is in reflection, whatever medium you start in, you end in, right? So you never enter into the second medium because you're reflected. Whereas in refraction, you're actually gonna pass from one medium into another medium. Now, one thing for you to think about is when you pass from one medium to another medium, what properties of the wave, what properties of the light has to change? And you can think about what we've discussed earlier to maybe come up with an answer to this question. So again, what happens to light as it passes from one medium to another medium? Okay, so we have a response here that the refractive index changes. So the refractive index is a property of the material. So it's not the fact that the light actually changes the refractive index, right? The refractive index is sort of just what it is. And we have another response, which is the color changes, wave changes. So not quite, that would be pretty fascinating if you had red light and air, and when it enters a fluid, it turns into blue light. Right, so that's not quite the case. The velocity changes, that is correct, right? The speed changes. And remember what we said earlier, the index of refraction is a measure of how much a medium impedes the flow uh, or the movement of light. So the fastest that light can travel is in a vacuum. So that's why the index of refraction is one. In any other medium, the index of refraction is greater than one. So the speed of light has been slowed down. So by virtue of moving from one medium to another medium, you know that the speed of light has to change. Very good. And uh, as Matthias nicely described, when you look at reflection, reflection is just having the light come back at the same exact angle uh, that it entered with. But Matthias, do you want to explain a little bit about how uh, in this case, we kind of have two possibilities with refraction where the light ray can bend either away or towards the normal? All right, yeah. That's a, 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 as good a place as any to introduce Snell's law. Um, it might be a little clunky to ask people to spell it out, otherwise I would, but Snell's law just says N1, the refractive index of the initial medium that the ray is in, times sine theta equals N2, the refractive, well, sine theta 1, equals N2, the refractive index of the medium that we are entering, times sine theta 2. What that is saying is that depending on these two guys, my angles towards the normal will change. It's saying that if the second medium is denser, so if I'm going to use new color for this, N2 is higher, then sine theta 2 must be lower. And con conveniently enough, it, that not, not proportional, but um, it is more or less uh, Monotonic, yeah, monotonic is the only correct term for that. Um, but yeah, theta will be decreasing. I did not want to start using trig terms here, since that would not be helpful. Um, but yeah, so what would that mean if I'm going from air, or let's say from a vacuum, just to be perfectly clear about it, to glass? Should I be should theta two be getting smaller or bigger? So n one is going to be vacuum, 
and M2 will be glass. Yeah, we're going to let a few votes come in. Yeah, everybody so far has nailed it. It gets smaller. Going into denser medium, it must be getting smaller, and vice versa. If we were coming out of the glass, then um, it would have to be getting larger. So we could also start here at A, go up here, and we'd actually see the exact same thing happen in reverse. That's actually a property that is true of all lenses, and we'll see that again in a little bit. And it's it's really useful. Very good. So essentially, we can see with refraction, there's one of two possible uh, situations that uh, depending on whether you're moving from a lower index to a higher index medium or vice versa, the light ray will bend either towards the normal or away from the normal. And that doesn't seem too complicated. However, between these two cases, one of the two is a little bit more interesting than the other. And this has to do with the concept of total internal reflection. So uh, here, uh, Matthias, do you want to walk through this? And probably the diagram is a nice way to explain how this works. Yeah. Um, let's look at this first in sort of an intuitive geometric sense without doing any math. So if I imagine I'm coming straight perpendicular out of the medium, I just said that it can't possibly matter because right, um, both according to the math and even the geometric drawings, it can't possibly matter what the difference in refractive indices is. That's pretty close to true, and so I should always be getting something coming out. But each time I come in at an angle, I should be refracting away from, well, less than I drew there, but away from the normal. So far, that should be less than surprising. But that does imply that if I'm always going away, at some angle, I'm going to get closer and closer to just being parallel to the surface of, of my denser medium. And well, no surprise, that is actually true. That can happen. Um, we call that the critical angle, the angle at which if you center light ray up, it would just be going perfectly perpendicular to the surface. It would not really escape it. Anymore. And beyond the critical angle, what you send up to the boundary is just going to come back down. Um, before we go on and like discuss the math of it, here's a quick reason why that's really useful and cool amongst the many others. There's a thing called a fiber optic cable, which is just this situation. N, N1 is greater, N2 is smaller. Here, N1 greater, N2 smaller. Um, and it's basically a little pipe, a little string, whatever you want to call it, of this N1. And I send a light ray into it. So if, if this is my my cable, I send a light ray into it like this. It bounces back, it bounces back, it bounces back. And now I've actually created a pipe that can send light. Turns out it's really, really good for transmitting data. And that's probably part of how you can hear me. There's going to be some fiber optic between the two of us. Very nice. So that tells you a little bit about total internal reflection, which is this phenomena where uh, when the angle of incidence, the angle at which the light ray strikes the surface, in this situation, if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, refraction cannot occur. So in that case, if refraction can occur, then all of the light has to be reflected. So that's why we call it total internal reflection. Okay. So now let's go ahead and apply this to lenses. And one thing that I do want to mention is, of course, there's a lot that we're trying to cover today. So uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to go through everything in a ton of detail, but we do want to uh, highlight a few key points. Right. So here, when we're looking at lenses, there are two types of lenses. There is the concave lens as well as the convex lens. Now, the way you kind of memorize this is uh, kind of straightforward that the concave lens just looks like it's a cave on both sides. Uh, and then the convex lens is sort of the opposite. It's convex on both sides. Now, here you can see the concave lens. Now, it's something important to know when you're looking at concave lenses is to know uh, 
where the object is and where the observer is. So in this case, uh, what we say is that if you're looking at a concave lens, uh, your object, which is generally denoted by an arrow, I'm going to draw it here on the left hand side, the observer is going to be on the opposite side and the observer I'm going to denote with an eye. And that shouldn't be any big surprise because uh, if you have a lens, you have to look through the lens in order to see your object. Now, you can see what happens with the light rays as Matthias drew out earlier is as the parallel light rays strike the lens, uh, they're gonna be diverged away. But if you look at how the light rays diverge, you can see that they diverge from a common point. And this common point is the focal point. And the focal point, again, the distance from the focus to the geometric optic is what is called the focal length. And something that's important to know for the MCAT is, Anytime you're dealing with a diverging optic, so an optic that diverges the light rays away, you're going to end up with a negative focal length. And conversely, if we're looking at a convex lens, which is also a converging lens, you'll find that when you place your object that the light rays will converge uh, at this point right here. And as a converging optic, this will lead to a positive focal length. And in rare instances on the exam of the MCAT as being mean, they will give you uh, sort of a situation with uh, possibly more than one lens. And this has shown up. Uh, so very simple example is, you know, as you can see Matthias and, and I were both wearing glasses. So that's a situation where you do have more than one lens in place. And in those cases, one lens generates an image that serves as the object for the other lens. And I think in this case, uh, Matthias, you had, uh, I think an example you wanted to walk through. Yeah, I did. Um, I'm going to wipe your much nicer drawing real quick to use my scribbles. Um, actually, I think you have to wipe those, but um, what I wanted to point out is if we, if we use that symmetric property from earlier, we said, okay, if I can go from A here, trace it along, I can go to B, that should mean I can also go from B right back to A. So you might wonder, well, why do I care? Well, let's say real quick, that I place the object here. I'm going to violate convention and say, I'm just putting it right on the focus and putting it on the right-hand side. And that would say that then the image should be formed or somewhere, we don't know if it's the same side or opposite side of the lens, but I would trace the rays emanating from the object to find my image. What does that say about the image that's formed? Feel free to give that a shot in group chat. In other words, if I follow, uh, if I follow those rays, where do they converge? If I come from B and out towards the left, where do they converge? They don't, they don't converge. You don't form an image. If you place the object at the focal length of a converging lens, over a convex lens, you do now form an image. And that seems like an important property. And it's in fact, kind of a break point of converging lenses. If you were to move objects closer than the focus, you'll get only virtual images. So you'll get what looks basically like it's not really divergence, but it looks like it. And you get a virtual image somewhere on the right. And I'm going to erase that because that looks illegible. But there you go. If you place it on the focus, you'll get no image at all because parallel rays simply don't converge. Very nice. And for those of you who are extra nerdy and really into microscopy, if you actually do this, but sort of with two lenses in opposite directions, that's how you can get sort of a lot of magnification without having lenses that are at a ridiculous distance apart.
Okay. So uh, this is lenses. So now let's take a look at mirrors. And uh, for mirrors, uh, we're essentially just going to run through the same ideas, which is uh, if you're looking at a mirror, uh, the nice thing is that the mirror and the, well, for a mirror, the observer and the object are going to be on the same side, right? If you think about it, you know, often the observer is the object. So something important to keep in mind that when you're looking at lenses, the observer and the object will be on different sides. But when you're looking at mirrors, the observer and object are on the same sides. And something you'll also note here is that if you have a concave lens, the light rays will converge. So if they converge, uh, that means you are dealing with uh, a converging optic. So that means it's going to have a positive focal length. And on the opposite end, if you have a convex mirror, you can see that the light rays are going to diverge. And if they diverge, they are going to give you a negative focal length. So I think in this case, we might have a little typo here, right? Because concave, that's going to give us a positive focal length, and then convex, that will give us a negative focal length. Yes, that is actually a transposition there. OK, which is something good to know, because you'll probably figure out that we made these slides back to back, right? So uh, the reason why I want to point this out is because if you look at concave lenses, concave mirrors, convex mirrors and convex lenses, and converging mirrors and converging lenses and diverging mirrors and diverging lenses, you will see that there is no trend whatsoever, right? So a converging lens is a convex lens. A converging mirror is a concave mirror. So these are things that you want to make sure you have memorized at some point. And Matthias, uh, do you want to perhaps explain why the plain flat mirror has an infinite, infinite focal length? Yeah, I'm tempted to throw that one to chat almost um, because it would be doable in two, three words to give an explanation. So give it a quick guess and then I'll, I'll jump in. And I'll in the meantime draw a sort of mock plain mirror. Over here is my observer and object. Here's a set of rays, and I'll parallel rays. Okay, nobody has given it a shot, but that is fine. Well, as you can probably imagine, if I were to look at where these reflected rays go. Well, if they come in parallel, they also leave parallel. Therefore, from a plane mirror, they simply never converge. Therefore, we cannot have a focus and we cannot have a focal length. As, as long as we accept some precepts of Euclidean geometry, but you know, that. Um, yeah, that is honestly it. They just do not form form any uh, focus. Mm -hmm. And Beatrice had a nice response, which is also a good way of thinking about it, that it's essentially a very large spherical mirror. So if you have a spherical mirror that's infinitely large, then it essentially becomes a plane. Yeah, very that's, nice. That's the uh, calculus slash astronomy way of thinking about it. I like it. Very good. So now uh, let's go ahead and try to apply this to an example. And uh, it's something that uh, you'll want to have memorized at some point for the MCAT are two of these equations, the thin lens equation, which is one over focal length is equal to one over object distance plus one over image distance. Uh, you also have the magnification equation that tells you about the size of the image in comparison to the object. So this is uh, negative image distance over object distance. And we have a brief example here. And I think for the sake of time, Matthias, perhaps you just want to go ahead and walk through how you would solve this one. Sure thing. Well, you would want to simply from the, make sure we're using the right drawing tool, uh, from the thin lens, isolate what you don't have. So we have an object distance, we have a focal length. So we're going to solve for one over I. So one over F minus one over O should give us our image distance. 
And once we have that, we'll have enough to solve for magnification. So we just plug in one over 10 and centimeters. Um, as a note, convention in optics is to use centimeters usually. Um, these things will actually work if you track the units in different units. They don't inherently break, but you do need to track your units, and I strongly recommend you use centimeters. We get one, of, 1 over 10 minus 1 over 20, which, depending on how inclined you are to do fractions quickly, is just 1 over 20. So 1 over i is 1 over 20. i must be 20. And from there, we can go ahead and solve for magnification. Magnification for us should be negative i over o should be negative 20 over 20 to give us negative 1. But what does that mean? And I'm passing that on to the group here. What in the world does negative 1 mean for magnification? How big is that cat? And what else is going on? And give it a second. Yes, so we've got some interesting answers. Uh, but then Victoria, you got it. And Beatrice as well. Equal in size. That's our one, our, our scalar multiplier for size, but inverted. The image is inverted. That's the negative in front of it. And there you can see the illustration of what this cat looking through a lens would look like on the other side on wherever we're projecting our image. Very good. And also as a quick interpretation of what M refers to. For M, all you care about is the magnitude, the numerical value. So for example, if your magnification was positive two or negative two, that means your image is twice the size of your object. If your magnification is positive one third or negative one third, that means your image is one third the size of your object. So in this case, since we have negative one, then our image ends up being the same size of our object. Very good. So that is a quick crash through, crash course of uh, converging and diverging lenses. Uh, I think uh, for the sake of time, let's skip past the chromatic aberration and let's take a look at diffraction. So Matthias, do you wanna walk through the slide? Um, yeah, I, we will have to talk a little bit about the property that leads to chromatic aberration because it'll pop up again um, later to a degree, um, or at least the property of monochromatic light that leads to chromatic aberration will pop back up, but we'll, we'll do that then. Um, right, so the single and double slit experiments, a series of experiments where we were trying to figure out um, what is this, deal, what is the deal with light? Why can't I just say it's a particle? Um, and a normal person would have, like would have just assumed that um, if you want to go ahead and show the particles coming in, um, that light is a bunch of particles. If I throw it at a slit, it should just filter through like water, wh whichever um, wh whichever particles are managing to get through the aperture will keep going in the previous trajectory. With some maybe hitting the corner a little bit, and I'm going to get something close to just a straight cone or maybe a little bit of scattering on the sides from hitting the edges. Um, it turns out though, like, well, from this we can predict that if I had, if I had just a sl small slit, I should see a certain pattern and that pattern should be very, very simple. It should be either very clearly delineated or maybe have a little bit of fuzz at the edges. One of those two. So I have a testable hypothesis. It should look something like that. That absolutely does not happen though. So it gets very confusing very fast. Turns out that if you have a slit that is on the order of the wavelength of light, so like if that light is 600 nanometers and the slit is 2,500 nanometers wide or what, what have you, um, just even just within an order is fine. Um, you're going to get diffraction phenomena. If you're 
that slit is much larger, you will not see this, by the way. Um, and the only way we really manage to make any sense of that is by thinking about wave properties. What we've illustrated here is just how a wave would actually propagate. Um, what you have here is some source very far away, basically infinitely away, so that just as uh, Beatrice said earlier, you can think of an infinitely large sphere as effectively just a plane at that point. Um, you have plane waves coming in, and you would expect if, if this thing acted normal and if waves were not special, it to continue as a plane, but it does not. It starts acting as a spherical wave again. Um, you get this, this pattern sort of explained by Thulian's principle. It's not too important. Just realize this. It starts spreading out like a spherical wave again. Um, but to really explain why, why all of a sudden we would get a banding pattern, we have to first look at what interference actually is. Because interference is a large part of what makes this happen. Um, can somebody tell me what happens if I, well, uh, let's maybe show them the, the two, the two in-phase waves. What happens if I add those two up? Yeah, one big wave. What is the period of that big wave? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically the same, but the amplitudes add up. Perfect, perfect answer, Carla. What happens if I instead take this wave and I move it half a wavelength to the right, as shown in the destructive interference example? Yeah, we get no wave. Now, the thing about that is that these waves are physically traveling, and so the, how they arrive will depend on the distance that they travel. Basically, if these two waves both started at the exact same spot in the exact same phase, they arrive in the same phase. If they started out of phase, they arrive out of phase. If they started in phase but traveled a different distance, they arrive out of phase. So we'll see that on the next slide, but that should give you some suspicion that if I send waves through a little slit and they go sideways, depending on where on the slit you are, you might have to travel a different distance. And this whole thing of uh, moving a wave is called a phase shift. You probably don't need that vocabulary, but the, the next one coming path difference is one worth knowing. Um, that's just the difference in the distance the light had to travel to reach a certain point. So here we've got sort of an, an empty ready-made slide. Um, and don't worry, Ken, this is intentionally completely blank and ready for, uh, for filling out. And with one sample point to reach, and you can see, well, if I compare the distance that A and B have to travel, who has to travel further? Yeah, B has to travel significantly further. Um, one thing that we can simplify for the sake of the MCAT is that you only really care about this little angle and that that is approximately equal, approximately equal to the angle that we're making towards the point that we're, we're going. And we then just kind of care about this little added distance, the difference between the two. Since without that, these rays form an isosceles triangle, convenient. So if we can estimate that distance, we can estimate the path difference. And it turns out just well, A for single slit. Um, A, the size of the aperture here, that's A, times the sine of theta, gives us by simple trig the size of that little, little question mark. So if that is some multiple of the wavelength, we end up getting um, destructive interference. Do not worry yourself for the MCAT about the trigonometry not a math exam. It's not a show your work exam. Understand that the path difference is what causes this. Um, understand it to the point that if I asked you, well, what, for example, for the green ray, what is our theta here?
if I did the same construction for the green ray, started from here, angle between the normal and the green ray, you're kind of thinking about the right way, Moria, but it ends up to being a zero degree angle. If I did that same construction as I did with the yellow, which would crowd it out a little bit, simply a zero degree angle. And sine of zero is Good star, zero. So what should I be seeing at the center of a double slit? A minimum or a maximum? Careful, this is a very tricky question because what A sine theta and lambda gives us is where the minima are. What I would have at zero degrees is a big old maximum. A lot of light over here. And the second equation, y equals m lambda d over a, do spend some effort for your exam memorizing it. Just all you need to know is that this y refers to the distance away from the center. And that the pattern is always symmetrical, so don't worry. This is the kind that is 50-50. You might be given it in a passage, but you might also be expected to simply have it memorized. Right, very good. So this is a little bit about how single slit diffraction is working. And of course, uh, there's the opposite case with double slit diffraction. So what's going on here? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm skeptical about calling it the opposite case because it's, it's actually an extremely similar case, um, at least in the sense of the pattern that we see. The phenomena at work are more or less the same. Interference is dominating and creating this pattern. Um, however, because we have two of them now, we basically have a sort of overlap of this pattern. We tend to, in real double slits, still get kind of a central tendency here. And the way that the math works out in shorthand is now that instead of, instead of looking at the size of the aperture, I'll delete that real quick, we're going to just care about the size of the gap between the apertures. Equations that pop out are almost identical. So now D for distance between the two. But, um, sorry, a little hiccup. Um, but what it gives us is a maximum. And this is an important difference. If I was writing a trick question, I would definitely make that the trick, the difference between minima and maxima. Single slit gives us minima and size of the aperture is what we care about. Double slit, maxima and the separation between the apertures, what we care about. All right, very good. So uh, essentially this is looking at phenomena of single slit as well as double slit diffraction. And uh, we did have a few examples we wanted to run through, but of course I, I know we're running a little behind and we did wanna run through uh, some of the questions that you guys might have uh, regarding anything related to the MCAT, uh, but we definitely have some diagrams that you're certainly familiar with. Uh, it's certainly, uh, we have this nice pretty diagram, which Matthias, do you wanna mention anything here? Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. And even on the, on the previous slide, um, we had monochromatic light shown at a, well, thrown at a diffraction grating. And what that gave you was then, well, monochromatic light contains all wavelengths. And you might recall that the equation for, um, for diffraction through a grating uh, depended on the wavelength of the light. So these different wavelengths diffracted differently. Um, sorry, I said monochromatic, but I meant exactly the opposite. Anyway, all right, on to this guy. This is the famous uh, photo 51, that, um, that X-ray crystallography from Rosalind Franklin that set the stage. Um, but what you'd want to think about is a lot of the times you, you might wonder why is, why study diffraction? Why is it so interesting? Because after all, 
we know how to make lasers, so we know the wavelength of light that we're throwing around. It's not that, not, not that exciting. Uh, we know what's showing up on the screen because we have rulers we can measure. And we know how to make a diffraction grating. So why do we care about this technique? Or is it, are we just going in circles? Turns out anything that obstructs light, which is anything that has a sufficiently dense electron cloud, um, can work as a diffraction grating. So we can use an unknown diffraction grating. We can get a little crystal, let's say crystallized DNA, throw it in between an emitter and a screen and some other things and a lot of math. And we can see what pattern comes out the other end. It turns out in this particular um, crystal that we weren't sure about at the time, there were phosphate groups. Phosphate groups are very electron dense and they were separated. So you get phosphate group, spacer, phosphate group, spacer, phosphate group. So we knew that much from just doing regular chemistry on it. There were these phosphate group, groups in there. We, so we knew which wavelength of light to choose, which it turned out was x-ray. Um, and just in case anybody's wondering and is having trouble interpreting this, this at the center, that's just basically a physical obstruction because otherwise the center would be too bright to get a good image out of this. Um, so we irradiated it and saw what pattern gave us. And we got a really surprising result. We got an X, seemingly like two strands crossing. That from there on set completely the groundwork and was more or less the, the seminal revolutionary step that's set us on the way to everything you know now about molecular biology. Um, that's, that's how we got here. And that's why, that's why diffraction might actually be important. Um, to this day, we still use X-ray crystallography. It doesn't look this fuzzy anymore, but it's still fairly complicated. Um, and it still works on the same principles. All right, very good. So hopefully that was a nice bit of a crash course on uh, some high yield uh, physics concepts, especially looking at light and waves. So in the last few minutes, uh, what we wanted to do is just chat a little bit about how Medical Coach can help you with your MCAT preparation. And also, of course, if you have any questions about any aspect of the MCAT, now is a great time for you to put those questions in the chat box as we will spend the remainder of office hours going through those questions. Um, so uh, something to add is uh, we have this MCAT app that we've created, which we think is a wonderful resource for students. Uh, we have all these great videos, questions, and flashcards, and we hope that all of you are enjoying these different features. Uh, we also know that for some students that they've been studying for the MCAT for a long time, they've made some progress, but perhaps aren't making quite as much progress as they're looking for. In these cases, uh, you can certainly consider getting MCAT tutoring, which uh, there's quite a lot of advantages. The first, of course, is that it's completely personalized, which means that when you work with the tutor, the tutor is able to design a custom study plan built specifically around your strengths and weaknesses. So spending time on the areas where you need more help uh, and for those sections that you're already doing pretty well, how to push you up even higher. And a little bit about Med School Coach in particular, uh, it's pretty easy to go to our website and just look at our team of MCAT tutors. You're gonna find that the vast majority of all of our MCAT tutors are all 99th percentile MCAT scores. So they've done extremely well in the MCAT, but another important factor for us is they also have to be good teachers. So we have an extremely stringent training process where we ensure that the tutors aren't just good test takers, but they're very good at communicating their knowledge of science content as well as strategies to students to be able to improve student scores. And I really don't have to say much about this, but if you look at the average score improvement for our students from either a diagnostic test they take at the beginning of their MCAT prep or from a previous MCAT score, the average score improvement for our students is between 10 to 12 points, All right? And of course, some students will improve more than that. Some students will improve less than that. Uh, the, dis the difference just depends a bit on where the students are starting. Okay.
And with that, uh, I know that we have several questions in the chat box, so we can certainly uh, start answering those. Uh, one quick question is uh, about rewatching this office hour. So all of our office hours we actually post on our YouTube page. So uh, if you go to YouTube and look up Med School Coach, you'll find that we have a channel uh, where you can get your questions answered on, uh, or you won't be able to watch any of our previous office hours. I know a couple of you here have questions uh, specifically about cars. Our last office hours actually covered car strategies and techniques going through how students should read and uh, really read cars passages. So let's start taking a look at some of the questions here. So uh, Matthias, uh, the student is struggling for with cars and they're asking how to improve cars, which of course is a, is a very uh, broad question. So I guess if you were to give students a few pointers, where would you start? Um, the biggest pointer would be uh, the main exercise we do is in teaching people how to do what's called reading holistically, which means reading the actual entire passage. Um, this is basically the fundamental skill to cars. And the way we usually practice that is we don't actually start with questions. We don't start with question answering strategies. These are all higher level things. We say, here's the passage. Here are a few sort of outline questions, basically a template for making an outline of the passage from me. Um, go ahead, fill that out, tell me about what was in this passage, and we repeat that until you're confident, basically reading a passage, getting the main point out of it, getting the main arguments out of it, getting the tone of the author, getting possibly what kind of evidence was presented, what kind of contrary viewpoints were presented out of a single passage. Um, Cars is not magical. It seems to reproduce the same results between similar people fairly reliably. Um, so many courses that focus primarily on giving you a, a, a question answering strategy up front will do you effectively a disservice um, in the sense that if you're not getting better at your fundamentals at actually reading the whole passage, you are adding a lot of cognitive work, a lot of things to do that don't help you understand the passage. Um, yeah, that is usually my biggest piece of advice. And um, I, do, uh, I do want to say that we do discuss question strategies and we do, do approach that, but again, sort of a holistic approach first. Yep, and I completely agree with that. It, often if, if you watch a lot of videos online, they'll, they'll often sort of advertise, you know, like this one trick that you do. And if you do this one trick, you're gonna get, you know, like a fantastic car score, right? It, it's just not the case. For example, you know, you'll watch some videos of people who say, oh, if you simply read the question stems before you read the passage, you're gonna do great on the MCAT. Right. Uh, I'll tell you for all these strategies, if they sound very gimmicky, they probably don't have much of an impact on students. Right. It's not to say that the strategies can help, but, you know, it might get you one to two more questions. Right. Which is not going to have much of an impact on your score. Whereas if you focus on, you know, some of the things that, you know, Matthias is describing, which is, you know, making sure you can actually read and understand the central thesis of the passage that's going to give you multiple more questions right for many, many passages. So you really want to focus on the changes that are going to significantly improve your score and not try to find these shortcuts that are really unlikely to work. And we have a related question here, which is how to approach passage questions, especially in cars, and how do you find the right information and use it? So here, this is essentially referring to kind of the source of information you're using for cars. For cars, there's different categories of questions uh, in terms of what part of the passage you need to answer the question. Some of these questions are what we call targeted detail questions, where they refer to something specific in the passage. So it might say something like, the word X, as used in paragraph two, most likely means. Right, so in that case, if they refer you to paragraph two, then you know exactly what part of the passage to go back to. And uh, as the opposite, you also have questions like, 
the main argument of the passage is, the main idea of the passage is, right? For these questions, it's uh, focusing on the entire passage as a whole, so there isn't any particular part of the passage to go to. So in these cases, that's why it's important to do what we mentioned earlier, which is make sure you can read and understand the passage. Uh, because if you're able to read and understand the passage, then you can often just go with your gut and be able to get the right answer choice. There are some questions, though, where it's a little tricky, where they don't give you a specific paragraph reference. Uh, and there you have to do a little bit more thinking about what part of the passage you have to go back to. A good example are reading beyond the text questions. So reading beyond the text questions will often ask you to consider how does new information affect the claims stated in the passage, right? So a typical question stem might be, if statement X were true, this would support which of the following passage assertions? In these cases, your four answer choices will be four passage assertions. And what you have to do is, for each assertion, go back to the passage and find it, and then check to see if this new statement would support or not support uh, that statement. So those questions are a little bit harder because you do have to spend more time uh, searching for the different passage assertions in the passage, but generally for the MCAT car section, if you read the question stem carefully, you'll have some indication of what part of the passage you should go back to. All right, and we have a quick question here about a diagnostic exam. What I will say is we currently do not have any diagnostic exams, but I'll also say that our first diagnostic, our first full length practice exam designed specifically for uh, the current version of the MCAT and incorporating really the most knowledge that we have about the current version of the MCAT based on released AMC practice questions is gonna be released at the end of July our second full length will be released at the end of August and our third full length is going to be released at the end of September. So unfortunately, this isn't going to be too helpful for those of you who are looking to take the MCAT uh, in July or August, but for those of you who are looking to take the exam in September, you might be able to take one of our practice exams. And certainly for those of you looking to take the exam next year, perhaps in January or later, uh, we'll have at least three full length practice exams for you. And Matthias, we have a question here from Beatrice asking why in single slit diffraction uh, do we have a minima if we see a central bright spot? All right, um, there's two parts to that answer. First, the simple one is that the equation that you present it with simply predicts where the minima will be, which is without rewinding here to the appropriate slide, um, which is if you recall, says that if the angle between the spot that we care about and the center of the slit, if that angle is zero, we should not see a minimum. We should see the opposite of a minimum, also known as a maximum. Um, so that already is consistent. That is saying, hey, according to this equation, at, at the center, there should be a bright spot. And then as I go off the center in either direction, I should be seeing my first minimum second minimum, third minimum, and so on. Um, as to why we see it and how exactly the geometry works out, it has a lot to do with picking the center of the aperture as our, as our geometric um, reference point. So rather than the entire equation really representing a greater physical truth, it represents the truth about the reference point we chose, um, but it's a convenient one. Trust me, it gets much uglier if you did not choose that. Um, I hope that that checks out. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that makes sense. <laughs> Great, and we have another question from Pat uh, who says that uh, their timing on the chem phys section is about two full passages uh, is, or off by two full passages. Any tips uh, for this? So when it comes to the chem phys section in particular, when it comes to pacing, there's several ways that you can improve the pacing. Uh, and I'll sort of, sort of go from you know easy to hard. So the easiest way to improve your pacing in the chem phys section is actually number one, improve your knowledge of science content, right? Here we can do a quick test. 
right? You can time yourself for how long it takes you to think of the one letter codes of the three basic amino acids, All right? So you can literally time yourself. So for a lot of students, they have to think, okay, first the basic amino acids, I have histidine, which is H, uh, arginine, which is R, and then there's that, you know, third one that, oh, it's lysine, which is K, right? So if you think about, you know, sort of the average student who knows their content, it can take them 15 to 20 seconds to come up with that response. A student who has very strong science content would just be like, oh, basic amino acids, H or K, right? Now, this seems trivial, but let's think about it. If a student can recall these science facts, you know, in five seconds compared to a student that takes 15 seconds, then that's 10 seconds per question. Uh, in the ChemPhys section, you have 59 questions. So you're looking at 590 seconds, which at that point is 10 minutes, right? So that's one thing that you can do to improve your pacing, which is uh, essentially have the science content memorized better so you can recall it more quickly. Another thing that you can do, which is uh, helpful, is learn to figure out what parts of the passage are important and what parts of the passage are unimportant, all right? So what I mean by this is when students are reading chem -phys passages, they often feel lost, right? Especially if it's an organic chemistry passage and there's all these steps and they have no idea what the heck is step one, step two, step three, step four, right? Uh, this is something that you learn from doing practice over time. As you do more practice passages, you start to recognize what parts of the passage text is the AMC likely to ask me questions about and what parts of the passage text are is the AMC, uh, could they possibly ask me questions about, but they might also not ask me questions, right? So as a simple example, there's some ChemPhys passages with four figures you have to recognize that the vast majority of ChemPhys passages have between four to five questions. So if you have a four to five question passage with four figures, are you going to get a question on every single figure? Probably not, all right? So then that's something you can learn of, oh, when I look at a figure or a table, my strategy should not be, let me spend a whole minute reviewing this figure in this table to see if I can figure out what are the different trends and patterns and what conclusions can I draw from the data. But instead, you might simply want to say, okay, I just need to know what this figure is about. Let me look at the x-axis. Let me look at the y-axis. Great, I know what this figure is about. All right, so that's the second thing that you can do to improve your pacing, which is just to recognize what parts of the text are important for you to uh, understand in your first pass and which parts you can just glance over and wait until you get a question on to read in more detail. A third thing that you can do is set checkpoints for yourself, all right? One thing that's nice when you complete the AMC questions is they'll actually show you how much time you spend on each question. And you can look at the distribution of time. For a lot of students who don't have a great internal clock of how much time they're spending, you can look at this and see, oh wow, for the first passage, I spent eight minutes on the first question, three and a half minutes on the second question, and then four minutes on the third question. And then you realize in total, you've spent 20 minutes on the first passage and then everything else you've had to rush through, all right? So for some of these things, it's good to be aware of, of are you allocating your time at least somewhat evenly across the different passages? And one way to help you with that is to set checkpoints for yourself. So you might say, for example, the car section has nine passages, nine passages in 90 minutes. So it's very easy for students to just say, oh, after three passages, I should have about 60 minutes left. After six passages, I should have about 30 minutes left. So if you use these checkpoints, if for some reason you find yourself spending too much time on a particular passage, you're able to increase your pace early on and not run into a situation where you have five minutes left and two more passages to go. Okay, so uh, those look to be the questions uh, that we have in the chat today. So uh, 
I want to thank all of you for taking the time and joining us today for this office hours. Remember these office hours are exclusive to those of you who are using our MCAT mobile application. So hopefully you're finding these to be helpful. Uh, another thing that we'd also ask is if you're finding the MCAT mobile application be helpful, uh, please uh, go to the Apple App Store, the Google Android Store and write a review for MCAT app. Our goal is essentially to uh, let as many pre-medical students as possible out there learn about this uh, MCAT app that we have available for students. And finally, if any of you are interested in uh, getting additional help in the form of MCAT tutoring, feel free to sign up for a free consultation. And you can see in the chat that we have a link where you can go ahead and sign up for that consultation. And finally, if there are any questions that you have, please feel free to email us at info at medschoolcoach.com. Otherwise, that's it. So thanks everyone and have a great rest of your evening.